Hello and welcome. Welcome everyone. I'm Dinsha Balsara. I'm a professor of physics and applied mathematics at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm jo joined today by my other colleagues who are Setupati Subramaniam uh, and Deepak Boria, both at my university, and Professor Harish Kumar, who is also on the paper from IIT Delhi. So we're going to present to you techniques, tricks, and algorithms for efficient GPU processing of higher order hyperbolic part of partial differential equations. And the reason for that is that this is a very interesting interesting topic because a majority of the, or a significant fraction of the usage of exascale machines is going to be based on such PDE systems. So it's good to have an efficient strategy for using such machines efficiently. Now, exascale computing is here and now, it's our present and it's going to be our future. Uh, and GPUs play an extremely important role in exascale computing. Now, the most common model that I've seen implemented at different exascale machine uh, uh, sites uh, is uh, there's multiple nodes that are connected via very fast interconnect, and each node consists of a multi-core CPU along with four to six A100 error correcting GPUs. So we're kind of evolving towards that model. And GPUs are very important because the processing power of a GPU far exceeds the processing power of a CPU with the result that there's an extremely strong motivation to use the GPU with the maximal efficiency, even if you don't want to use the CPU too much or not at all or whatever. So that's our model. Now, GPUs do come with some limitations. First of all, the maximum memory on the, on the typical GPU is about 80 gigabytes, whereas on the node, you'll have something like two or three terabytes of memory, which basically means that if you do a simple division calculation, uh, eight, uh, two, uh, two, two terabytes, which is 2000 gigabytes divided by 80 gigabytes, you come up with a number like 26, which basically means that you have to chunk up your data into smaller chunks, 26 or so chunks, each of which can be sent uh, um, you know, four at a time or six at a time to the GPU. So that's going to be our model uh, with with which we have to work because all these high performance exascale computing applications are always done where you're using all of the resources, memory, as well as computing resources of the machine to the absolute max. Uh, so that's the life we have to live with. So that the limitation, the memory limitation of the CPU basically forces us to such a processing model. We also realize that the data transfer between CPU to GPU is extremely slow compared to normal data transfer. So it basically means that once you go on to the GPU, you have to do the maximal amount of processing on the GPU before you can bring the data back. In other words, just one trip to the GPU, do all the processing you want, come back to the CPU and you're, that's it. And all the major amount of data is going to accumulate back on the CPU basically because of the previous point, which basically means that the CPU is the one which is going to do MPI messaging across nodes. Now we're interested in higher order Gardner schemes, which are grid-based methods and grid-based methods for solving partial differential equations. And we're interested in a raft of different partial differential equations, including hydrodynamics, MHD, electrodynamics. So that's going to be our application mix. And you can see that because of this application mix, we're going to have to use the GPU very efficiently. Now, all of these applications require CPUs with rather large caches. So it basically means that if you want to use GPUs, you have to choose out the specific set, subset of algorithms that are available, which use the G CP GPU's cache in the most parsimonious fashion. So that's also kind of a conflicting demand that is placed on us. Now, <clears throat> what we realize is that we have a whole raft of possible algorithms that we can use in the package of higher order Gardner schemes, but only a few of them meet all the three requirements of using very small amount of memory, of having very efficient processing on the CPU, on the GPU once it's there, and on working within the confines of the small GPU's caches. And we also want to understand, have an application that is minimally intrusive. That is to say, we don't want to tear down the whole code and write another CUDA code because that would make it impossible for us to meet the verification and validation standards that are there for the code. So what's a typical hyperbolic partial differential equation? It can be written in this very simple form. 
du by dt plus f times du uh, uh, plus du by dx of the fluxes is equal to zero, which basically means that at each zone in the computation, you have a slab of fluid like the one shown out here. And therefore, what you do is that each slab of fluid, for example, this slab out here, evolves in response to the fluxes that are going across the boundaries of your computation. So the two ways of doing time stepping, one is to use Rangakata time stepping, which uses multiple stages, or the other is to do ADER, which is a one stage up, uh, update. And what you realize is that the ADER is better because it only involves one trip to the GPU and back, whereas the two stage Rangakata or the multi-stage Rangakata will use multiple trips to the GPU and back. So the algorithms are all based on the idea of first doing a reconstruction, then, doing a predictor step to evolve in time, and then doing a corrector step, which uses Riemann solvers to stabilize the calculation. So with that, let's look at the available choices that are available consistent with the limitations that we have on the GPU, namely sm very small amount of main memory, very small caches, and very expensive to move data from G CPU to GPU and vice versa because of the low bandwidth. And we see that you can actually read this in the paper, so I won't be labored this too much, but there are multiple choices for how to do the reconstruction and in which variables to do the reconstruction. This is all detailed in the paper. Also for the time stepping out of all the available choices, only one remains as a good option. Also out of all the possible Riemann solvers, only one remains as a good option. And the, the conclusion is that despite the fact that there are many algorithms available in the higher order garden of toolkit, only a few of them go through when it comes to meeting all the limitations on the GPU. So it's like literally like threading a proverbial needle. Now, we also need a min minimally intrusive approach because thousands, literally many tens of thousands of man hours have been spent on developing, verifying, and validating these codes, which means that a full CUDA-based tear teardown is not an option which basically means that we have to retain an open FCC type approach. And we have to ensure because of the verification and validation requirements that the CPU and GPU results are virtually identical. So that is what I will show you at the end of this talk. Now, the way we've designed this paper, which is due to, which is in a late stage of review for CAMC, is that it's designed to be a one-stop shop for anyone wanting to port any higher order Gardner scheme to GPUs using open ACC. So, this is an example of a pseudocode. Now a real code, a real hydrodynamics code would have multiple other features in it. Namely, it would even have an MPI based substrate for kind of exchanging data across nodes. I'm not showing that because I'm showing you the most basic type of hydrocode that you could write. And what you'll see in all the pseudocodes that I will show, and I will show a few, is that the open ACC pragmas will always be shown in red. So you see that we have some open ACC pragmas to ensure that some pieces of data like these ones out here can be taken from the CPU to the GPU or can be created on the GPU so that we can work on the GPU. Now, another important thing is that you will see that we have new data constructs being introduced. And the whole idea of introducing these new data constructs, which are introduced in blue, is that we're declaring a very small number of variables. And this very small number of variables contains the minimal amount of data that needs to migrate from CPU to GPU and then back again after it's been processed from the GPU back again to the CPU. And in Magenta, you're going to see the one and only subroutine extra new subroutine that we had to introduce, namely this one out here, so that we could actually go ahead and unpack the data that we're moving to the CPU. Uh, I'm sorry, to the GPU. So that is the idea out here. So we have C, C++ versions of the pseudocode also documented in the paper. And the idea is that if you have a good open MP code, you will actually be able to write good open ACC code. So that's kind of giving you an idea of where, where you need to get started. So let's look at the only new structure, the only new subroutine that we had to introduce. It basically takes the minimal amount of packed data that we have, which has been sent over to the GPU, 
And then it basically unpacks it in this loop. But this loop itself shows you something very important. It shows, us, shows you, first of all, that the same private and shared structure that you have for CPUs is also available on GPUs, except it's called private and present. So you make use of that. And the other thing that it shows you is that on a, on, on a, on a CPU, if you're using OpenMP, you're probably going 32 or 64 way parallel. But you have to remember that on a GPU, you're literally going 5,000 way parallel. So if you're going 5,000 way parallel, the only way you're going to exploit all that parallelism is with collapse three. And so that's the idea out here. So the pseudocode for the reconstruction is shown out here. And it's a very simple pseudocode. Again, if you understand the uh, whole notion of CPU computing, you understand the whole notion of GPU computing. But the important directive is this data copy in and the update device that you have to use. So there's not much by way of insight on the uh, reconstruction front. Now, the predictor step that is there in each of these applications is extremely important. And this is a very computationally expensive step. And therefore, what you what we have to do is understand that we will actually have to go ahead and declare or have a subroutine which does this predictor step. And this subroutine will have to be declared as sequential. And you have to match it up with a corresponding sequential call out here. And that's the important idea out here that we have. Then if you go into the Riemann solver step, this also has the same idea that you see out here, namely declare the Riemann solver to be sequential and match it up with pragma inside this uh, subroutine itself, saying that it is sequential so that it can, it can be processed in a serial fashion. Namely, it can be processed where each subroutine entry is viewed as independent of every other subroutine entry. And with this, we come to the last piece of pseudocode. But the whole idea is that we packed all that data up into a single variable. And here you see us repackaging it after the update so that we can now take the data back from uh, GPU to CPU. And that's very important. So this reduction operation is also shown out here, which is kind of giving you one-stop shop so that you can actually go ahead and understand how reductions work. So what are the results? The results are actually very good for many of the applications that we're trying. So for example, here you're seeing as a function of a single core, a single Xeon core, what the A100 GPU can do for you. And so this is showing you the GPU speed up relative to a single CPU core. And as a function of the number of zones that are in each of the patches that has moved across. And you can actually see that the speed up is pretty good because you're getting literally 85 to 100 times, uh, 110 times speed up. For MHD applications, the news is even better because you're literally getting somewhere between 100 to 120 times speed up. For CED applications, there's a little bit of bad news, which is to say that it asymptotes to a smaller value out here, more like something between 60 and 80 times. So that is not necessarily so appetizing. The way to understand this is that the, C, the CED applications require an ADR formulation that is different so that because it needs to be able to treat stiff source terms. And such formulations are intrinsically more expensive. So we've gone ahead and done some profiling. So this is actually showing you second order, third order, and fourth order CFD applications on the top row, and second order, third order, and fourth order MHD applications on the bottom row. And you're seeing that as you go to higher order from second order to third order, and from third order to fourth order, the full bar out here shows you the total time taken, but this purple bar shows you the amount of time taken for the GPU, uh, for, for the processing of the ADR itself. And you're seeing that as you go to higher order, the ADR takes up a larger and larger, progressively larger and larger fraction of the total processing time. And that is an unfortunate thing. And you're seeing that even for the MHD, but wait till you see the same thing for the CED, where you're seeing that the uh, ADR basically takes a, a gigantic amount of the processing time. Now, to some extent, it is natural that the ADR should take, uh, take a larger amount of uh, processing time because it's filling in for a larger and larger number of Rangakata substages as you go to higher and higher order. But it actually shows you that for certain application classes, namely for CED, 
we do have a problem and therefore we do need to design better algorithms so that we can actually perform with uh, optimality on GPUs. And uh, my most important takeaway from this is that it's very value valuable to co-design algorithms that are tailored to meet the strengths uh, and avoid the weaknesses of the GPUs. And this actually in the future should require a synergy between those who are computer scientists and can help with that. And those who are very knowledgeable in the computational science aspect of the problem. So there are such people who can actually straddle areas and those people will play a very valuable role, I hope, in getting funded certain efforts and initiatives to make sure that the deficiencies of the GPUs can be overcome by intelligent algorithm design. So with that, the other alternative would be to actually use Rangakata instead of Ader. So we've done some profiling on that front also. So what is the next best choice or, uh, compared to Ader? The answer is the next best choice is to use Rangakata. But you're seeing out here, that if you use Rangakata, which is shown with the dashed curve compared to using Ader, which is shown with the solid curve, you're going to have a decrease in the performance by a significant factor from year to year or from year to year. So you're going to get basically a factor of two or more decrease in performance if you go from Ader time stepping to Rangakata time stepping. So it actually shows you that to some extent, the choices that we've made are indeed as optimal as they can possibly be in this circumstance. Now, we began this talk by saying that we want to do higher order garden of schemes, which basically means that I have to show you that we're indeed meeting the order of accuracy property, both for CFD, where you're seeing that our second order scheme performs with second order accuracy, our third order scheme performs with third order accuracy, and our fourth order scheme performs with fourth order accuracy. Likewise, we do the same thing for MHD, and likewise, we do the same thing for CED, which is computational electrodynamics. So we actually go ahead and meet the accuracy requirements, which is extremely valuable and extremely useful for verification and valid validation exercises. And the nice thing about these error correcting GPUs is that we can literally really show that the error on the GPU minus the error on the CPU, absolute value thereof, is absolutely bounded to less than one part in 10 ways to 10, or for the most part, less than one part in 10 ways to 12 or 10 ways to 14. And you see that here for the CFD application. Likewise, you see that here for the MHD application. Likewise, you see that here for the CED application. And so th these two are the strongest wins in the sense that it shows us that if you do your calculation on a CPU or, or on a GPU, you will be roughly speaking, 80 to 100 times to 120 times faster than a single core CPU. So that's a very good news. It shows that this uh, GPU does register an obvious win. It also shows us that we meet all the design accuracies. We're not losing anything by way of validation and verification if, if we go ahead and move everything to a GPU and do it intelligently. And it also shows us that indeed we get answers that match up literally exactly but by about one part in 10 raised to 12 between GPU and CPU. And that's very good news. And of course, the research has uncovered some ideas and areas for improving, improving the situation. So with that, I will thank you.